time there. Yes, good day. Good day. Just a little token of our appreciation to Nancy Gibbs and Michael Duffy. And now we'll do a second round of question card pickups. So if you have a question ready for our speakers, please raise your card in the air. One of our volunteers will pick that up from you. But while we're doing that, we will start with the first student question from Lynn University to our speakers. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Renuka from Lynn University, and I wanted to find out, I'm directing it to both of y'all, which is it, the office that makes the person, or would you say the person makes the office? Oh, that's a tough question. That's I'm, really I'm hoping Nancy will answer that. You know, one thing that we've found is that, you know, they're, one reason they're very curious about each other, they, when they like to come back, they look at how the new guy redecorated and what they're doing differently, because, um, they do know that the office changes the man. Uh, so far, all men, that may change one day soon. Um, but that, that the nothing, and they all say this, there is nothing that they bring to it that can prepare them for what happens when they get there. And they all say some version of this, that there's no book, there's no handbook, there's no guidebook, there are no lessons. The first President Bush told us that you can study the office and run for the office, but until the day you get your first intelligence briefing, you just do not know what you are in for. And it changes them. And there are very few people who understand what it does to you. Um, presidents only make hard decisions. This is something they each warn their successors of. The easy decisions will be made much further down the chain of command. Any decision that gets to your desk is a difficult one, which means that whichever way you decide, there was a good argument for going the other way. And so they all carry with them extraordinary scars and regrets and thoughts of the road not taken. Even the successful ones leave the office changed and they leave it with, with burns and scars that they carry with them for the rest of their lives. And it is actually probably the thing that binds them together the most because it is something that very few of the rest of us can possibly understand. Second student question, please. My name is Christopher Van Ward. I'm a graduate student at Lynn University. Um, I was wondering, last week, I think, um, the official portraits of uh, George Bush and his wife were unveiled at a public ceremony hosted by the current president and the first lady. Additionally, uh, Obama has stated that when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed by special forces, he, had, uh, he let know George Bush of this. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between those two presidents and perhaps what our country could learn of that relationship. Well, uh, between Bush two and Obama? Yes. There is no relationship, All right. unfortunately. Um, that was a remarkable scene because we hadn't seen the two men together. Other than that lunch that where Bush invited them all together. Even that was, uh, I think, something that Obama had requested. There isn't much of a relationship between those two men, which isn't uncommon as you go through history between someone who has just left and someone who comes in. Takes some time. On the other hand, I think the club's been really good to Nancy and me lately, don't you? I mean, they've been in the news and they've been trying to be in the news and we were really grateful to everything the club has done for us in the last two weeks. I just, I just want to say that. And though they don't always get along, they do agree that this is an important project and vital. So I'm, I'm grateful. And I will Thank say you. about um, George W. Bush is when he left office, um, partly I think having watched what happened with his father, he said, Obama deserves my silence. And he was very intentional about not criticizing, not speaking out. And even a few weeks ago when he came closest to saying, I might have done a few things differently, that he might have built the Keystone Pipeline, you know, he'd like to see his tax cuts extended, he followed that by saying, but I don't think it's good for our country to undermine our president, and I don't intend to do so. So I think George W. Bush has pursued a very conscious strategy of, of staying in the shadows by and large, of not being a critic. There are plenty of other people to do that, and it's sort of a club protocol about not criticizing your successor publicly. And it's in a contrast, when not all of them abide by it, but I think he has been very intentional about that. Thank you. Who is or was a better ex-president than president? Well, the winner and grand champion there is Jimmy Carter, who, who will tell you if you ask him, I'm a better ex-president than I was president. But with Carter, you always get a little extra. And he also will tell you that he's a better ex-president than the other ex-presidents. <laughs> uh, 
Who is your favorite president and why? Oh, golly, I don't have favorites because um, that just would make life too hard. But I do think after all of the work that we did and all of the surprises that we kept on coming across, that I will say I was most surprised by Herbert Hoover, who um, I, I, the one thing that didn't surprise me is my father spent his entire life working for Boys Clubs of America, which Herbert Hoover basically founded. Um, and so I knew he had done extraordinary work for underprivileged boys through his life. But uh, you know, he still was synonymous in my mind with the Depression. And, and, and seeing what he did with Truman, seeing the humanitarian work that he did, which was quite extraordinary, you could argue that Herbert Hoover with Truman saved more lives than any two figures of the 20th century. And I don't think that is something that we know or acknowledge. So while not my favorite, I certainly think the most underrated or underappreciated in all of his dimensions, maybe. I, I think better of all of them, with the possible exception of Nixon, who is really difficult um, story to tell positively. And I tried. <laughs> Couple of questions on this. Is there a president Wives Club. Uh, we didn't look for one. Um, uh, we know that there's a general sympathy between members of first families because they know what a you know difficult life it is to be in the bubble. Um, my own sense is that what makes the President's Club a little grittier and um, real is that the the nature of the decisions that they share are so much more difficult and the mistakes they make are so much greater, and so the scars are so much deeper, and so the, bi the bonds are so much more unusual. Um, someone else will have to write that book, though. It's not going to be us. Well, speaking of writing books, as co-authors of the President's Club, how do you divide the work, researching, gathering data, fi and finally then writing? What kind of partnership did you need to accomplish this, and how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, it took us five years. The division of labor was very easy. Uh, I did the dead president, Michael did the living ones, so my interviews were much easier. <laughs> and last question, uh, who would you say has the strongest partnership either of living or dead presidents? We need to huddle for a second. I think the jury is deadlocked. Uh, I, have, I was impressed. I'll say I was impressed by the Ford-Carter relationship, which lasted 25 years, and the fact that um, these men who, had not, who really did not speak to each other for five years after 1976 would, within a few years of rekindling a relationship, promise each other to give the eulogy of whoever died first, which uh, an honor that fell to Carter when Ford died in 2006. Uh, that's an astonishing turnabout. Um, for political rivals. I think it was possible by the fact that they were both relatively moderate, both men of faith, both unsuccessful one-term presidents, or at least not triumphantly re-elected, either of them. So I think that bound them, and I think they also understood that they were more stronger within the club as a team than they would have been as individuals. Okay, I have a final, final question. <laughs> Did Mitt Romney and or President Obama call you before they started campaigning? Not yet. <laughs> to be concluded, book two. Thank you, everyone. We'll have a book signing in the lobby.